Okay, this is going to be a verse-by-verse -verse study on the book of Jude. So let's look at Jude and verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. First off, we see that Jude doesn't care to refer to himself as a servant. If you are a born-again Christian, then you should be proud to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, who purchased you with his own blood, as it says in Acts 20:28. 20, and in 1 Corinthians 6:19, it says we are bought with a price. So we are servants to God. He bought us. Lost men would find this undesirable, but yet they don't care to brag about being servants to sin. They serve alcohol, they serve money, they serve fornication, they serve food, they serve pain pills, and everything else that's wicked. But yet they see themselves as free and not in bondage. They are in bondage to sin. They have given themselves over to fornication and to alcohol, and that stuff controls their everyday life whether they know it or not. But other men in the Bible refer to themselves as servants, such as Paul and Titus chapter 1 and verse 1. Peter and James do the same thing in their books, and the tribulation saints are referred to as fellow servants in the book of Revelation. But Jude verse 1 says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. If you are born again, then you are sanctified by God the Father. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. If you are sanctified, then you are set apart. There is a sanctification. You get a salvation that is permanent, that will last forever. And you, then you have a daily sanctification where you try your best to live a holy and separated life. And we are not only sanctified, but we are preserved. Jude verse 1 says we are preserved in Jesus Christ. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are preserved. You are going to live forever with a glorified body. Your salvation is eternally secure and nothing can take that away. The second death will have no power over you. But the devil is at work to try and counterfeit this preservation through transhumanism. Or anything where man is trying to preserve himself and live forever through anything else but Jesus Christ. A man may prolong his life for so many years, but he cannot get eternal life in any other way but by coming to Jesus Christ as a sinner and believing on him and his shed blood. Not only this, but Jude verse 1 also says we are called. We are called into the grace of Christ. And Jude verse 2 says, Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. These are three things that we needed from God. We needed mercy because we are sinners in need of a Savior. We need the peace of God, which only comes when we believe on the Savior. And we need the love of God. And God showed this love when he came down in the flesh and said, greater, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Christians will need mercy at the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul said about Onesiphorus in 2 Timothy 1.18, The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. The in that day in this verse is referring to the judgment seat of Christ. This is because that judgment is said to be a terror. Even though we're not judged for sins, but for service, it's still going to be a fearful thing when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And Christians need daily peace that only comes from God through prayer and Bible reading and holy living. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When it comes to love and love with Christians, it says this in Romans 5 and verse 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied.
Jude is saying he wants you to have these things and wants them to be multiplied. I'm not good at math, but here is some Bible math. Notice how verse 2 says, be multiplied. So, we should multiply our mercy and peace and love toward each other. Not only this, but the Bible says to rightly divide in 2 Timothy 2.15. And that means apply verses to who they are to be applied to and don't take the entire Bible for yourself in a doctrinal sense. Even though it's all for our learning, we need to rightly divide the book and apply the verses to who they're supposed to be applied to and not take things out of context. So the Bible talks about multiplying. It talks about dividing. And the Bible also talks about adding. Second Peter 1, 5, and 6 says, And beside this, Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. Not only adding, but what about subtracting? The Bible talks about taking away from the word of God. You have men who want to subtract words from the Bible. And Revelation twenty-two nineteen talks about someone in the time of Jacob's trouble taking away from the words. And it says that person can have their name taken out of the book of life. But moving on, Jude verse 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Beloved, when he says beloved, he is saying he loves them. And for many, this has become something that you only say to the opposite sex or to someone related to you. And with so many sodomites running around, men think it is strange to tell a brother in Christ that they love them. But the apostles did it like he did here, and Paul does it all the time. So, Jude verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, he gave, gave all diligence a careful and persistent work or effort he gave all diligence to write unto them the common salvation a the salvation is common it's for common everyday people you don't have to be some big shot person to get it and he says it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints Notice how it says it was needful for me to run into you. It was needful. Many believe this proves that there are lost books of the Bible. Since the word was in the verses in the past tense. So they believe that there was another book of Jude that's lost somewhere. But this doesn't prove anything other than that Jude wrote other epistles that the Holy Spirit didn't put in the Bible. So he says, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Contending for the faith. The faith as a body of truth that has been taught by faithful men and that has been believed. If you're a Christian, then you believe in a body of truth. There are things that you've been taught that you believe and you would Stand up for those things that you believe in. And Jude 1.4 says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing we see about these ungodly men is that they crept in unaware. In 1 John 2.19 you have bad guys that go out from the flock. But in this case... The bad guys are creeping into the flock. And these are wolves. In Acts 20:29, 20, Paul talks about grievous wolves entering in. In 2 Timothy 3, 6, it talks about those who creep into houses. And the Bible lets us know that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light and minister of righteousness. And his ministers are ministers of righteousness. They creep in subtly. Satan deceived Eve through his subtlety. So these ungodly men in Jude 
verse 4 crept in like a nice, well-dressed, polite gentleman. It's harder to deceive if you show, show your true colors. The word ungodly is mentioned six times and three verses in the book of Jude. And four of those times in just one verse. I believe Jude is a last day's book. And this shows there are many ungodly creepers creeping in in the last days. These men cut out scripture. Like Jehudi in Jeremiah 36.23. They twist the scriptures like it talks about in Second Peter 3.16. And they take away scripture, as we talked about earlier. And some even add to it, as the Bible warns against as well. In Proverbs 30 and verse 6, it says, Add thou not unto his words. But Jude in verse 4 says, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And this is like the ultra grace guys who believe the Holy Spirit won't convict you of sin. And that you should continue in sin even though you are saved by grace through faith. These ungodly men promise you liberty. That you can go out and drink and fornicate and do everything else. And not reap what you sow as Galatians warns against. Uh, 2 Peter 2.19 says, While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. These guys promise you liberty to practice all types of filth and sin. They say it is okay to have filthy communication, filthy conversation, filthy dreams, filthy magazines, and so on. But Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Just because we have eternal security by the grace of God doesn't mean we should abuse the grace. Notice Jude said in verse 5, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. A man can deny the Jesus Christ of the Bible while preaching that he believes in Jesus Christ. He is simply teaching a Jesus Christ not found in the scriptures like most of these ultra-grace guys do. Uh, the Jesus Christ that is described by the contemporary Christian rock and rap crowd is a false Christ that's not in the Bible. He is a false Christ because they make him cool and acceptable to the world. He isn't the Jesus Christ of the Bible because they portray him as someone who will just pat you on the back every time you do something wrong. And we'll go out and have a beer with you and cut up with you and participate participate in your sin with you. And Jude verse 5 says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Many times we need to be put in remembrance of some things. John 14, 26 talks about the Holy Ghost teaching you and bringing things to your remembrance. The problem with most people is that they aren't letting the Holy Ghost teach them through reading the Bible and studying. He doesn't bring verses to your remembrance because you aren't reading any. But Jude verse 5 says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. This is foreign to many professing Christians today who don't believe God destroys anything. Many preachers don't even have the word destroy in their vocabulary. But Matthew 10, 28 shows us that God can destroy both soul and body in hell. And many of these false teachers today won't even mention hell or the lake of fire. But even though Revelation 20 and verse 15 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I doubt these modern sissy preachers will mention this verse. If they do, they probably change the verse to, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into a lake of puppies and pancakes. They don't like what the Bible says. So they'll change the words. They'll go to the Greek and say it's really supposed to be this. 
or they'll take stuff out of context or they'll twist it to make it say what they want it to say but Jude verse 6 says and the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day their own habitation was the third heaven but they left and went into a far country like the prodigal son many of them followed the anointed cherub which is satan and they fell right along with him satan isn't an angel or a fallen angel he just appears as an angel of light revelation 12 9 lets us know that satan has angels under his power fallen angels shouldn't be confused with unclean spirits or devils they are something different entirely these angels rebelled against god and took on flesh so that they could take to themselves human wives as it says in genesis 6 4 many claim the sons of god in genesis 6 4 are simply saved men who married unsaved women but let's look at the verse genesis 6 4 says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of god came in into the daughters of men and they bare children to them the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown notice how it makes a distinction by saying sons of god and daughters of men why is it that saved men were getting with unsaved women but the saved women weren't getting with the unsaved men and why do the sons of god and daughters of men produce giants if it is simply humans with humans and why are the distinction sons of god daughters of men many also claim that when it says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that that it doesn't have any connection to sons of God marrying the daughters of men. They don't believe that there's any connection there. Other than that giants were roaming the earth at the time the sons of God got with the daughters of men. But by reading the verse it seems that giants were in the earth in those days and also after that. Because of the ungodly mixing of angels with women. The in those days and also after that would cover the time of their conception and on into the future. If it happened once, it could happen again if God allowed it. And many will take you to 1 John 3, 2 to prove that sons of God are saved people. And yes, sons of God are saved men, but no man in the Old Testament was born again or a son of God. If you say people in the Old Testament are sons of God, then you fail to rightly divide the word of truth. So these guys apply 1 John 3, 2 to righteous men in the book of Genesis. But how do I prove the sons of God are angels? It's easy if you just search sons of God in your Bible. It'll take you to Job chapter 1 and verse 6, which says... Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So what are the sons of God doing hanging, hanging around with the devil? When confronted with this question, the non-dispensationalist will say that the devil was coming to accuse these sons of God because he is the accuser of the brethren. He is the accuser of the brethren, but the brethren weren't in the third heaven with god in the old testament they went to paradise or abraham's bosom and that is why the rich men in hell saw lazarus and abraham in the heart of the earth then when you say this the non-dispensationalist not all of them but a lot of them will say that there is no such thing as abraham's bosom and that it is just a part a body part it is abraham's chest cavity a lot of them teach that all righteous men in the Old Testament went to the third heaven when they died. Even though Jesus Christ hadn't even shed his blood yet to pay for their sins. The examples they gave are exceptions. The examples they give are Enoch and Elijah. Both of those guys went to, he went to the third heaven. And they are exceptions because neither one of these men died. 
if Job 1 6 isn't enough proof that the sons of God are fallen angels and not saved born again Christians then consider Job 38 in Job 38 4 through 7 it says where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth declare if thou hast understanding who hath laid the measures thereof if thou knowest or who hath stretched the line upon it whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy if the sons of God were here when God laid the foundations of the earth then they couldn't be a godly line of Seth or any other saved people or humans period this shows they are angels not cherubim or seraphim are unclean spirits because all those are a completely different class from angels and Psalms 82 6 through 7 says I have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes these gods die like men because they rebelled against God they took on flesh and fornicated with human women and the non-dispensationalist calls this a sci-fi fantasy. It's hard for them to believe in a supernatural event like this one in the scripture. Even though when Genesis men were living to be over 900 years old and you had people walking by the Garden of Eden seeing a cherubim with a flaming sword. I mean times were different. Real different. I'm sorry you have watched so many sci-fi movies that you believe everything strange has to be some kind of fairy tale. That's what the devil's done. He's made all these sci-fi movies that are against God and it's caused all these people to see everything that is strange or unordinary to be some kind of movie or fairy tale. Satan deceived you with the movies. He didn't deceive us. The Bible teaches these things that are strange like that another argument they have against the sons of God being angels is that since angels are spirits as it does call them in Hebrews 1 14 since they are spirits they couldn't have physically been with human women but if you read the story of Lot in the in Sodom how they the angels came to visit him and the Sodomites wanted to fornicate with the angels the angels took on physical reality and ate food at Lot's house so they can do physical things and the people of Sodom wanted to fornicate with them. Angels in the Bible are always male without wings and that is what separates them from the cherubim and the seraphim who have wings and they aren't female like you see all the angels on TV. The Schofield notes claim that they are sexless. He says all angels in the Bible are sexless. And he takes you to Matthew 22 30 which says for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angels of God in heaven. It never said they were sexless in Matthew 22 30. It said in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angels of God in heaven. Notice the key words in heaven. But what about the angels of Jude 6 who left their own habitation? The angels who kept not their first estate. Those aren't the angels that are in heaven. And Hebrews 1.5 is the verse that they used to completely get rid of angels ever being called sons. So they say angels were never called sons of God. They believe this is the knockout punch to the doctrine that I'm trying to teach. So let's read it. Hebrews 1 5 it says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So they say, See here, angels are never called sons. These guys that teach this also profess to be King James Bible believers and profess to never take away one word from the precious Bible. But they do here in Hebrews 1 5. They have to completely overlook and ignore a very key word in the verse. And that word is begotten. 
God has never said to any angel, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Because angels aren't begotten sons. Jesus Christ is the first begotten son. He is the first person born of God. And that is another reason why men weren't born again in the Old Testament. If Jesus Christ is the first begotten, then how was Abraham, Noah, and Moses born again? But if you want to believe the sons of God are saved men in Genesis 6, just like they are in the New Testament, then that's fine. I could care less. I still like you. I still want to be your friend. I'm not going to call you a heretic or a false prophet just because you don't believe like me on this particular doctrine. But if you disagree with those guys and say that the sons of God are angels, they will jump down your throat and call you a heretic and everything else. And it's not that big of a deal. Uh, Jude 1, six, And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So these fallen angels are in everlasting chains under darkness until the great white throne judgment where they will be judged by us, Christians. 1 Corinthians 6, three says, Know ye not that we shall judge angels. So the angels are taken off the chain to be judged. They were in everlasting chains under darkness, but will be brought up to the great white throne judgment. This is where you get the slang term, off the chain. When I was in school, if a kid thought something was cool or hip, he said, that's off the chain. And funny how the devil creates these slang terms that pretty much call evil good and good evil. In the Gospels, the maniac of Gadara, the man who was possessed with devils, it was said of him that no man could bind him, no, not with chains. So the devil possessed man was off the chain. And the devil has made this, or a while ago, made this a cool slang term for people to use. And uh, Jude 1 7, or Jude 1 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, just like the fallen angels, gave themselves over to fornication and went after strange flesh. Fornication is so dangerous because if you keep doing it, you eventually give yourself over to it. You don't have power over it. It has power over you. This is why pornography is so addictive. You think you are controlling it, but it's controlling you. You read about the strange flesh in Leviticus 20, 15 through 16. This can cover sodomy, bestiality, or incest. But notice the end of verse 7 in Jude. It says, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Notice the ing at the end of the word suffer. This shows they are present tense suffering in eternal fire, even after all these years. Hell is forever. You don't just burn up and cease to exist. By mentioning, by Jude mentioning Sodom and Gomorrah, it puts you into the days of Lot. And the last days are like the days of Lot. We are shown that in Luke 17, 28. And this is another reason why I believe Jude is a last days book. But moving on, Jude verse 8 says, Likewise also these filthy dreamers, defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Maybe the reason you have filthy dreams at night is because you defile the flesh during the day. When you commit fornication, you defile yourself. You're sinning against your own body. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion. Verse 25 in Jude shows us that God should have dominion. These filthy dreamers despise that dominion. These filthy dreamers 
are the same ungodly men we talked about before who deny the only Lord God and turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. They not only are filthy dreamers, but they have filthy communication, filthy conversation, and they fill your, your head with filth. They promise you liberty to practice filth, and they do it for filthy lucre's sake. Titus 1.11 says, Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. That means they are doing it for money. Money as in little nasty pieces of green paper that is filthy. Did you know that money is the most filthy thing you can touch? And that is why they get on TV and beg you for money. They love filth. Uh, they will give you a free gift. Or they call it a free gift. If you give them a love offering of $50. They say you can have a free book with their picture on the front of it. If you just send them a love offering. And that is just a scam. The book isn't free if you have to pay for it. That's stupid. God doesn't need your money. If he wants your money he can get it himself. These men whose God is their belly just need more money for a new private jet but jude verse 8 says likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh despise dominion and speak evil of dignities yet michael the archangel when contending with the devil he disputed about the body of moses durst not bring against him a railing accusation but said the lord rebuke thee I believe Michael didn't go after Satan here because he knew he was going to get him in the future. Revelation 12, 7 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. God needed Moses' body for Matthew 17 along with Elijah's at the Mount of Transfiguration. And Elijah, he didn't die in the Old Testament. He went up similar to Enoch but both Moses and Elijah are also coming back in the time of Jacob's trouble as the two witnesses Moses has to come back and die again he is the other exception to the rule in Hebrews 9:27 Hebrews 9:27 says and as it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment that is a general rule for most men and there are exceptions, and these exceptions have individual men in the Bible who typify these exceptions. Enoch is a type of the Christian who is alive at the rapture. Enoch was translated having never seen death. Just like a born-again Christian at the rapture gets taken up to heaven, and he never has to see death. And Enoch is a picture of that. If you make Enoch one of the two witnesses, then you lose this type of the born-again believer going up at the rapture. Because both of the two witnesses die in the book of Revelation. Moses is a type of the tribulation saint. The tribulation saint who dies during the tribulation, but gets resurrected before the millennium. Then enters the millennium and dies again of old age. Isaiah 65 20 talks about a hundred year old men being considered a young person when Jesus is running on the earth and also talks about men dying during the millennium so Moses died in the Old Testament he comes back again as one of the witnesses and dies again so he dies twice matching the tribulation saint who dies twice and Elijah is a type of the tribulation saint who physically survives the tribulation but enters in the millennium and dies of old age because unlike us he won't have a glorified body. Remember there is more than one rapture in the scriptures. The body of Christ goes up in a rapture before the tribulation starts. And then there is another rapture in the tribulation. Those who are alive during this tribulation rapture are caught up without dying, just like Elijah. And they go up to the marriage supper as guests at a wedding. And then they later face death, just like Elijah. 
and they come back and face physical death or Elijah comes back and faces physical death as one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. And this book of Jude has a lot in it. It's crazy how much is in these 25 verses. And Jude 9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, that said the Lord rebuke thee. We definitely need to follow Michael's example. Don't try to take the devil on. He is a lot more powerful. Just memorize a bunch of scripture and when the devil or devils tempt you, pull out those verses of scripture and quote them. That way you can let the Lord rebuke them. Uh, Jude 10, But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally. As brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. If you have read Second Peter, then you notice a lot of similarities between Second Peter and Jude. Check out Second Peter two twelve. It says, "But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things they uh, they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption." Uh, these ungodly men we talked about before, who are after your money. They are brute beasts. They speak evil of the things they understand not. One of those things would be the Bible. They don't understand it. But Peter and Jude call them beasts. And the devil loves to take things that are bad in the scripture. As I said before. Like the word beast. The, the word beast in scripture is used for the Antichrist. It's used... For these ungodly men in Jude. And the devil made it into something good. People look up to basketball players like LeBron James. And they say, man he is such a beast. And all these rappers brag on themselves and say, I am a beast. Uh, a very interesting lyric from a Little Wayne song is when he said, I am a beast. Feed me rappers and feed me beats. That's an actual lyric from his song. And I know he is not meaning this literal and he isn't some kind of cannibal or something. But I thought it was strange because the Antichrist is referred to as a beast. And he will also practice cannibalism in the tribulation. And Little Wayne says, I am a beast. Feed me rappers and feed me beats. That is why in the tribulation, the saints will take 1 Peter 5, 8 very literal because the Antichrist the beast will practice cannibalism and first peter says 5 first peter 5 8 says be sober be, be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour so little wayne said i am a beast feed me rappers and feed me beats then he says i am untamed i need a leash those are very scary and interesting lyrics because Remember the maniac of Gadara I told you about before, the man who was possessed with devils. It said about him that no man could bind him. No, not with change. chains. He couldn't be tamed. Uh, these rappers are devil possessed and they brag about it. I like what Denny Castle said one time. He said, back then in the Bible, devil possessed men had to live in the graveyard. But nowadays they're on the covers of rolling stone magazine and parents are letting devil possessed men and women into their homes through television you don't have to worry about going to the strange woman's house because she comes into yours she comes in your son's bedroom by the way of instagram and movies but uh, jude 10 says but these speak evil of those things which they know not but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves Second Peter 2, 1 and 2, 2 says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth is evil spoken of. And Jude verse 10 says, But these speak evil of those things which they know not. 
They speak evil of the truth. These ungodly men hate the way of truth. And Jude 11 says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Cori. Notice it says, Woe unto them. And this also puts me in mind of the last days, because that matches what it says in Revelation 8.13. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. So what did Cain do? He was jealous, he killed, and he lied. So you have these ungodly men who are jealous killers, and they are liars. They tell lies to get your money. And they, they kill you spiritually if you keep listening to them. So you have these ungodly men who are jealous killers, and they are liars. Then they have the same error as Balaam. Balaam betrayed God and Israel by telling Balak that the best way to destroy Israel was to make sure they intermarry. And when they intermarried, they would take on all the false gods of the strange people that they intermarried with. Then God himself would destroy Israel. And Balaam did this for money. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. Just like the ungodly men who preach and teach all these stupid doctrines and try to get you to give a love offering, they do this because they love money. They do it for filthy lucre's sake. Notice also Jude says, And perished in the gainsaying of Cori. Cori is Korah from the Old Testament. In the book of Numbers, Korah goes against Moses. Moses, who God appointed as the leader. And this rebellion against God and the man he appointed led to Korah being swallowed alive by the earth. The Bible talks about Korah going down alive into the pit. And this puts you in mind of another thing that will happen in the last days. In Revelation 12, 16, the earth opens her mouth again. And Jude verse 12 says, These are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead plucked up by the roots. They feed themselves without fear because their God is their belly. And there is no fear of God before their eyes. They are unwise because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Their wisdom is not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. They are spots in your feasts of charity. Clouds they are without water. Clouds without rain can't quench your thirst. And these false prophets lead you to a place where you beg for a drop of water on your tongue. They don't know about the water of life because they haven't accepted him. They are carried about of winds because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Their converts are the same way because they are tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. They have itching ears and, not on, and only want to hear some new thing like the people of Athens. And they are trees whose fruit withereth. Uh, Matthew seven fifteen through 16 says, Beware of false prophets which come, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Maybe not just their fruits as in good works, but by the fruit of their lips. Like Hebrews 13.15 talks about. They may not have any good fruit. And the fruit that they do have is dried up and dead. Jude 12 also says they are twice dead. They are dead spiritually. And they also face the second death at the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20.14 says and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. A lost man is dead spiritually. One day he's going to die physically. And then one day he's going to see the second death. 
and be tossed into the lake of fire. If you're born once, you die twice. If you're born twice, you die once. And that's why you need to be born again. But Jude verse 12 says, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Raging waves are moved by the wind. Remember before how we said they are carried about of winds and they foam out their own shame. They are devil possessed. If you look at Mark 9.20, it says, And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. So you have there a connection between someone foaming. And then the book of Jude says they foam out their own shame. And then the verse says they are wandering stars. Angels in the Bible are referred to as stars. Like in Revelation 120. And the angels in Jude 6 left their own habitation. They wandered away from God. So that's something to think about. That's possibly what it could be referring to. Raging waves of the sea. Foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Notice blackness associated with punishment. And this punishment lasts forever. Eternal punishment for eternal sin against an eternal God. And they have this reserved. But if you are a born again believer, you also have some things reserved. 1 Peter 1.4 says to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. And that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. This inheritance referring to a home in heaven. And this inheritance isn't for godly men and the angels which left their first estate. What they have reserved for them is the blackness of darkness forever. And 2 Peter 2.4 says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment. 2 Peter 2.17, These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. In Job 21.30, that the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. But back to Jude, Jude verse 14, it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh. With ten thousands of his saints. And notice it didn't say Enoch wrote. It says Enoch prophesied. It says Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied. The Holy Spirit just told Jude what Enoch said. Uh, Jude, or Enoch didn't have to write it, write it. Or have it in writing. Jude was told by the Holy Spirit. That that's what Enoch said. What Enoch said was inspired and Jude wrote it down. There is no lost book of Enoch. Many people say that this lost book of Enoch should be in the Bible because of this verse. But it didn't say Enoch wrote any, anything. It said he prophesied. And he said, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And Deuteronomy 33 and verse 2 says, And he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. So Jesus Christ is coming back with all his saints. How many saints? Ten thousands of his saints. Tens of thousands. And Jude 15 says to execute judgment upon all. And to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds. Which they have ungodly committed. And of all their harsh speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You can tell Enoch liked to refer to these men as ungodly. Because there is nothing godly about these men that's been described so far in the book of Jude. And Jude 16 says these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words. Having men's persons and admiration because of advantage. Their mouth speaketh great swelling words. 
And Peter adds to this in Second Peter 2.18, he says, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. They talk a good talk, but they are full of hell and full of the devil. Romans 16, 18, for they are such, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Uh, these Christian rock songs have a bunch of good words, but the music itself is wrong. But through good words, the good words in the songs, they deceive the hearts of the simple. And Proverbs 14, 15 says, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. The serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. That's how these guys get you. The devil appears as an angel of light, and his henchmen appear as ministers of righteousness. But Jude said these are murmurers and complainers. And 1 Corinthians 10.10 10 says, Neither murmur ye, of, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Uh, God doesn't like murmuring and complaining. Notice Jude 1.16 says, Walking after their own lusts. Their lusts and sins are their pets. They have a bunch of pet sins and they walk after them like a man would walk his dog. So there you have 13 verses about these ungodly forerunners of the Antichrist. Jude 4 through 16. That's 13 verses and the number 13 in the Bible is the number of rebellion. The first time the word 13 shows up in the Bible it says this. 12 years they served Cheddar Laomer and in the 13th year they rebelled. So the law first mentioned for the number 13 the word 13 is associated with rebellion. But Jude 17 says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like I said before, it will be hard to remember the words that were spoken if you don't read the book. If you don't read the book, then God can't bring to your remembrance. And Jude 18 says how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Notice it says last time. Further reason for me to call Jude a last day's epistle. And Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 3, knowing this first that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts. To mock is to treat with contempt or ridicule. And that's what men are doing, mocking the King James Bible and mocking Jesus Christ. They mock and say, where is the promise of his coming? They don't believe he's coming back again. And Jude 19 says, these, these be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. They don't have the Spirit, and this shows that they aren't saved because Romans 8 and verse 9 says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And the verse says they separate themselves sensual. When a man is wanting to teach something wrong, he separates himself with his converts. He doesn't want anyone around him to expose him or rebuke him. And Jude verse 20 says, But ye beloved, bidding up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Notice it says most holy faith. Type in most holy, the phrase most holy. An e-sword or sword searcher. And notice how many times the phrase appears in the books, book of Exodus. When they were under a faith and work set up. And then keep that in mind when you read the next few verses in Jude. Jude 21 says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. Keep yourself in the love of God. I don't have to keep myself in the love of God because he keeps me in it. Romans 8.38 says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
so does Jude one twenty one, which says, Keep yourself in the love of God, contradict Romans 8.38-39, which says, Nothing can separate you from the love of God. No, because the Bible doesn't have any errors or contradictions. The Bible never contradicts. And I'm not going to change the verse in Jude or spiritualize it to make it match Romans 8.38. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read 2 Timothy 2.15 which says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If Jude one twenty one is telling someone to keep themselves in the love of God, then there must be someone down the road in the future who has to keep himself in the love of God. And it says in Jude, looking for the mercy of of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. So Jude one twenty one is obviously towards those saints in the tribulation who are under a faith plus works setup. They have to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. They have to reject the mark of the beast. So they keep themselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. I don't have to keep myself in the love of God. Nothing can separate me from it. And I didn't look for God's mercy. His mercy found me. And those are the differences. But Revelation 14, 12, read it. It says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. If they take the mark, then they aren't keeping all the commandments. I don't see any, any other way around it. You either accept what Jude 21 says, or you reject it, or you spiritualize it to make it say something you want to say. Most of these guys will spiritualize it and try their best to twist it and make it match Romans 8, 38, and 39 when it doesn't. But Jude 22 and 23 says, and if some have compassion, making a difference. If you want to make a difference, then have compassion. Most people ain't having compassion on anybody, especially Christians towards other Christians. You got these guys ready to kill each other because one believes in the pre-trib rapture and the other one believes in the post-trib pre-wrath rapture. And they're just yelling at each other and calling each other names. And it's just really immature and stupid. And it says, and if some have compassion, making a difference. You're not going to make a difference being a jerk. And others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Some do better by when you show them compassion, and then some do better after you scare them. Some men get saved because they saw that Jesus loved them, and they wanted to accept him because of that reason. And other men get saved because they don't want to go to hell. You save them with fear. Describe the horrors of hell to that person. If you do this and they get saved, then you are pulling them out of the fire. And that would be the spiritual application you could get from verse 23 for the Christian. Doctrinally, though, I think it's referring to a soul winner in the tribulation, warning a brother not to take the mark and go to hell. Notice it says, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Did you know that according to Leviticus verses... 1347, it, it shows you that leprosy gets in your garments. And Jude 23 says, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And a leopard has spots. The Antichrist is called a leopard in Revelation 13. In Leviticus 1342, it says, if a man has a reddish sore, a reddish sore, then he has leprosy. Connect that with Revelation 16.2 which says the men who take the mark get a grievous sore. So a man who takes the leopard's mark, the antichrist mark, the mark of the beast, gets a sore that can get in his garments. Jude 23 says pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. In the tribulation, they will be able to look at your clothes and be able to tell if you took the mark. I was thinking the other day, a good picture or 
foreshadowing of this is these guys going around with 666 and the all-seeing eye on their clothes. Their heart is rebellious. They have given themselves over to the devil. And it affects how they act on the outside. Their clothes are reflecting their rebellion and allegiance to Satan. And you can tell who they show their allegiance to by looking at their clothes. Just like in the tribulation, the guy who takes the mark of the beast is going to get a sore and it's going to get into his garments. Jude 23, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Uh, Jude 124 says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. In this age we are in now, the church age, he isn't just able to keep you from falling, he will keep you from falling. We are in him and he is in us. We are part of his body, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He can't cast us out because he can't deny himself. Uh, Jude one twenty five says, To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Uh, Jesus is God, and He is our Savior. Just like it says in Titus 2.13, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And this God should have glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever.